Hello, welcome to the DevOps uh, Pro 2020, and I'm Kalle Sergesalo, and I'm here today to talk about Dev, what is DevSecOps. Um, so I lost all my slides, <laughs> so <laughs> I was a bit too far. So, okay, back, uh, back to the beginning. So yeah, uh, I'm here to talk about security at DevOps Speeds, and I'm Kalle Sergesalo, I work as a director of something in, so I, my current title is director of platform, but I'm in charge of the ethical rules operations, and my job is to keep everything running for our customers. And I've been at ethical for five and a half years, and I'm managing about 15 person team. Uh, before Christmas, I was managing about 30 person team, but because the amount of locations and people started to get big, uh, we split it to two, and I'm managing a remote team of 15 people. Well, everybody's now remote because of Corona, but <laughs> it was supposed to be that I'm managing the multiple countries at the same time. Um, yeah, um, my background is in games. I come from the game development world. Uh, I worked here for a few years. And before that, I started as a bookkeeping uh, business for my family. Uh, when I was about nine years old and got some nine years of experience of doing bookkeeping in Finland. It was fun, not really. Um, I studied in Kajaani and moved there to the Helsinki city in Finland where I am now. And according to the government, we are being blocked from the whole Finland. So Helsinki is now its own state, I guess. And my hobbies are my cats and saving. So yeah, I come from Ethical and in here I'm part of the Ethical root DevOps tools and techniques as a service. Um, our job is basically to keep everybody's DevOps tools running, even when Corona hits you or anything else happens. Uh, we are about 350 professionals in Ethical and we uh, keep everybody's development practices going towards the culture of DevOps and ways of working. We've been doing that since 2007 when DevOps wasn't a thing and we were doing it in the name of software automation uh, optimization projects or something like that. And now 10 years later we are doing it going in DevOps like everybody else. Uh, we have about 12 offices and uh, today I'm going to be talking about you what is DevSecOps and uh, what, well my main point in the whole talk is that DevSecOps is DevOps and the Sec is just something that was added there for management. But yeah, uh, basically this is my short slide on what is DevSecOps. So it's a man another trend to managers like cloud and big data to make them understand that, hey, actually your security is not supposed to be its own department, but rather be part of the development practices, same as your business is supposed to be, your quality is supposed to be. Uh, everything needs to be tied up with your development practices for you to be secure. Uh, yeah. And after that, uh, the aim in the DevSecOps part is to bring information to people that, hey, Security is also the team's responsibility and everybody's responsibility. You can't be, hey, let's get security here to do the DevSecOps. No, you have to have the team involved in DevSecOps. Uh, it's also about shifting with the security. So not doing it at the end, but rather having everybody involved in it from the beginning. So we have for that the static analysis uh, that do the code analytics they do analytics from your binaries and your dependencies and so on. So idea is to improve that. Uh, <clears throat> the other idea is to make the security process go faster. So when you remove the uh, problems like headers and so, uh, you end up having uh, the process of security auditing going faster because uh, you're less likely to have uh, critical security vulnerabilities if you're doing your quality assurance and your uh, development practices uh, already in the development so that you understand, hey, we need to test, uh, for example, that no pa password ha can can't, can't go through. You have to actually have a password to log in. Uh, it's also there to pick the low hanging fruits from security and making it faster. So <clears throat> the ideology is that yeah, when you pick the low hanging fruits, the security auditing actually has some content for you to think about. 
uh, there is you get a lot more explorative testing time, for example, and you get a lot more uh, information on where you could improve your architecture, for example. Uh, it doesn't remove the security auditing needs. Uh, it doesn't solve the security itself, so you need to still think about the security, and it doesn't prevent bad architectures. And one thing that I forgot to put it here, uh, it doesn't remove human errors. It uh, enables you to <coughs> notice them faster, but it doesn't remove them. <coughs> and to do DevSecOps, um, you should do uh, DevOps. Basically, you can't do uh, DevSecOps without DevOps because that DevSecOps is DevOps. But yeah, don't tell that to the upper management. They might uh, cause a free call that they are hyperword is not hyperword enough. Um, so then I'm going to go through a bit of the practices of uh, what you will be getting. Uh, like, what should you do to have more of the uh, security processing is going faster? What are the low hanging points? What would you be doing? How do you do them? And where do you start? And at the end, I will be demoing you through some of the security practices that we offer, for example, or we have been working with our, our customers to enable them to have the security practices more into the development practices. So the first thing, um, this took me a while to understand, but the more I've been doing the code reviews and more I have been part of the development, I've noticed that the code reviews are actually part of the security uh, practices. <clears throat> so if you think about any certification such as ISO 27001 or comparable, <clears throat> you always have this that has the change been um, evaluated, have you thought about like ha has authorized been on it and so on. So code reviews actually force you to think about, uh, look at other people's code and have this sort of auditing process for it and figure out can we maintain this, is, does it build things and it's the place where you catch the biggest offenders easily. So if you someone notices that hey you are logging plain text passwords in a full, uh, code review, well most likely they will comment hey why are we logging code, uh, plain text passwords, I don't really feel this is good. Uh, if you're trying to push code that sends money to your bank account, well that's not going to go through code reviews uh, or if it, if it will, then the other guy wants his, his bank number also there. So both of you are then liable. So on, like uh, code reviews actually increase the um, uh, auditability of your changes to, from one person to multitude, and it enables uh, better traceability on changes. So then we come to the actual why, like, Code reviews in itself adds a lot of security already. But when you start automating the code reviews, so when you start bringing there that, hey, we have these checks, we add dependency check, like, hey, is everything uh, working as the dependencies that we have agreed on? Have we, uh, has the build been already through builds and is it safe enough? Uh, how are we deploying things? Uh, those are appearing here. Uh, you see that someone else has approved it already by machine, for example, in, Bit, in GitHub, for example, they automatically check your dependencies and inform you that, hey, there is security vulnerabilities here, and we're going to go to the dependency scanning soon. But the ideology of having uh, automated notices in your uh, code reviews improves the security by removing, once again, part of the human error part. <clears throat> then what we want is uh, the CI to test low hanging points. So important things to add in the CI, if you don't do anything after this, is to have automated tests. And the automated tests should test something like how it does the logging work and uh, have their uh, try to type empty password, uh, try to type uh, password that uh, is wrong and see that those fail at least. Then you can add more uh, such tests like uh, try to go to this URL without logging in. And as long as those fail, you end up having a nice uh, fast time. And you don't need any uh, tools for that. If, well, you need some kind of automated, automated testing tool such as Robert Framework, but uh, my recommendation is that you should anyway be using them. So ideology of having a test tool 
is already there in DevOps. So at that point, you should just add the test there to see, hey, oh, we don't have these stupid permission things. Uh, <clears throat> then if you go a bit far, further along, uh, you could add a dependency checker plugin. So if you're using Jenkins as in the picture, you can add a plugin called dependency checker, which uses the OWASP's dependency archive. It's complete. Uh, it's not the best plugin. It's, it doesn't do all the good stuff as it should, but at least you get some idea that, hey, we might be vulnerable now. It doesn't do continuous checking. It doesn't follow the binaries. It does it, does it based on the name matching. So uh, please uh, don't trust it as a, hey, this will solve everything, but rather uh, use it as the first steps to checking, oh, we, we by the way, are kind of in trouble. <clears throat> That's all without adding any tools to your CI. So at that point, you only have Git checkout, uh, your te automated tests, and one plugin running dependency check. Then if you haven't already, um, at this point, I would usually ask from my audience, how many of you are using static code analysis? Uh, I recommend adding the static code analysis to your pipeline. And after that, I would add uh, automated, uh, basically uh, automated uh, binary scanning, such as uh, JFrox, uh, X-Ray, or Sonatypes Nexus IQ. We'll go into those in a bit. But yeah, more to the uh, static code analysis. So static code analysis, uh, so it's a sonar cube. In my case, um, sonar, sonar cube is easy to get and it's free uh, as long as you take the community edition and then you can expand it on with the developer licenses and so on. And you get a lot more value out of the sonar cube when you have those. But basically it already helps you up quite a lot because uh, it, tries to smell from your code uh, the bugs and the vulnerabilities. In addition, it offers you these code smells, coverage, and duplication, which both mean uh, more upkeeping work from your team. Uh, <coughs> this enables you to focus on developing the tool, uh, the code, and not like actually trying to patch these in production after you find them uh, in the security auditing. You already find the uh, code vulnerabilities and bug vulnerabilities that uh, would be affected uh, automatically because they are known practices in the code, uh, static code analysis world. This once again doesn't remove all the coding problems or anything. It only recognizes the problems that are known and are problematically uh, known. <clears throat> so <clears throat> in there, uh, Stuff like vulnerabilities would be uh, that, hey, add a method parameter to something in Java, in this case. Uh, it's, uh, it gives you the CVE and where is it and why is it insecure. And you can then audit it and say that, hey, this is not actually a problem for us or fix it if it's a problem. Uh, you can also have a conversation in uh, SonarCube. And that enables you to talk about the uh, uh, automation pipelines and so on, like, uh, hey, should we actually block uh, builds going through? We have the quality gates, and we can then block builds going through where uh, the, we create additional security vulnerabilities. So if, even if you have old code base, you can take uh, static code analysis into use, just configure your quality gates uh, so that it's easier for you to uh, not have problems. So basically, you know that you have a certain amount of security vulnerabilities, but you don't want more. You have a certain amount of bugs, but you don't want more. So configure it so that uh, at least new ones are not allowed to be added to your project. <clears throat> then uh, we get to the static uh, binary analysis. So in here, we come to the tools like uh, JFrox uh, X-Ray and ne Sonatype Nexus's IQ server. I'll show them in live in a bit, but the idea here is that here, these are continuously monitoring your binaries. So uh, when you push data to JFrox Artifactor, in this case, uh, X-Ray starts automatically following that if you have configured it and informs you, hey, there is a vulnerability here. Please, uh, please uh, take notice and fix it as soon as possible. 
So it enables you to avoid problems like, hey, there is uh, 600 Docker images in our environment, and where does, does this vulnerability of, uh, let's say that uh, Nginx has a vulnerability, where does that uh, affect us? Well, you can just go here and start searching for it from all your Docker images, and it shows you the problem, problematic images. <clears throat> it also uh, tells us what's happening, why is the vulnerability, and what package brings it with. So, for example, if we have a Jackson XML parser, as my example is using, uh, it tells you, hey, there is a vulnerability in this version. Please upgrade the version. It gives you the references on where it has come from, uh, what's the issue, and so on. It tells you more detail on what is the impact and how easy is it to fix. And it also tells you the type, so security and license. So uh, usually we have two things. We have the vulnerabilities and we have the uh, uh, license problems. So these tools are meant for both. And both are your security problems. And we'll get to the licenses in a bit. But for the security side, uh, you also get uh, recent vulnerabilities and top five vulnerabilities. So you can actually uh, make plans on what should you fix and when have you done most of your vulnerabilities and when have you done them. So you actually see uh, the problems and can start planning around them. So then back to the licenses. So uh, I have actually a story about this. So uh, I was sitting in uh, Germany. Uh, I don't remember the city, sorry. Uh, I tried to remember. It, it was uh, somewhere in Germany. And I was sitting with the Atlassian Staff Regions uh, person, or one of the managers there that manages our Atlassian partnership in uh, Daf region. And I was sitting with them and or him and discussing about Atlassian licenses. So he was telling me us how he does like free lunches. He doesn't like to pay for lunches when he's home, uh, but rather wants big companies to pay for him. So he calls their CFO or comparable license manager and asks them, uh, would you like to go to for lunch? I have a pet for, with you. So uh, one of us will pay the lunch. And they go to the lunch. And he asks, do you know how many Atlas and licenses do you have in that company? What tools are you using and how many? And according to him, the statistics have been that 40% of the companies know their Atlas and, uh, or that he has paid zero times the uh, dinner or, or runs in his case. And 40, the customer knows only 40% of their licenses, their Atlas and licenses that they pay for. So year up on point speed bucket. And they don't know all of the licenses. They only know 40%. So they pay 60% more than they expect to Atlassian currently. Think about that from the terms of the software development. I can tell you that I have no clue, or I have no clue actually, uh, before we started using anything to license reporting, which licenses are we using, what are capable of using, what should we be using, and what open source tools are using. Because as a developer, I didn't care about the thing that much. But uh, the more I came to the director level and the management level, uh, the more I understood that we have these legal precedences that we have to actually follow. And uh, someone's going to ask at some point and evaluate them. And we have to actually check that everything is compliant to our rules. And if we have to have some licenses visible in our web page, we have to inform those. Uh, we can't just be, hey, uh, we have some licenses here. Um, at least that's what's going to happen when we, uh, if at any point anything happens. So yeah, uh, licenses, you should really start looking into how to manage your licenses. And then uh, after having all of these tools, so I'll go through them a bit more in detail when I get to the tools, <coughs> you should integrate them all to the binary management. So, uh, or yeah, not binary management, but get code reviews. So when you have all of these uh, parts in your 
So when you have done SonarCube, you have done CI, you have done uh, X-ray an uh, analytics, you have added uh, test automation, you should integrate it to your code reviews because nobody is going to go to watch all of the 67 tools that you add or 69 tools or any amount of tools that you have. They're going to want to check it when they are doing the code review. So when you do the pull request that's already required in your process, the team wants to know, okay, did it pass or did it fail? Okay, it failed. Uh, I'm just going to not review it, please fix it first. And the uh, per person responsible has to go through and remove the troublesome parts. So it doesn't actually allow him to push the code without having passed through these checks. And that allows us to remove human factor. So process should look something like this. So we have Bitbucket uh, and that has the Jenkins integration or any CI integration that you use. It doesn't have to be Jenkins. It's just uh, most commonly used. And you integrate the Jenkins to SonarCube and you integrate the Jenkins to Artifactory. And the rest of the data just flows through automatically. Uh, in this case, I forgot to draw a line from X-ray directly to Bitbucket. And you can also make uh, SonarCube send either just daily builds or send the details back to Bitbucket automatically. So there is nowadays in Bitbucket uh, automatic feature for this. Or if you're using GitLab, there is similar features there. And if you're using uh, GitHub, there is multitude of uh, different tools there already available. <clears throat> so then back uh, to actual demo. Uh, hopefully you can see. So uh, at the moment, uh, you should be seeing my screen. And here I'm showing the root portal. So, some things uh, that I'm going to go through are Bitbucket, and then I'm going to go through a Yankees pipeline that, uh, where that goes. And after that, it goes to SonarCube and does SonarCube analytics out of it. And from there, it gets deployed to uh, Artifactory, where it analyzes it with the X ray, so JFOG X ray. And then we have uh, the Nexus IQ configured in another job to Every time we do a change, it automatically does an uh, next IQ scan also for demo purpose. Uh, in this case, so our project uh, is root demo, and it's our demo project for what that we use for demoing our system. So we have two different things. We have the Yankees files uh, for the uh, X-ray, and we have Yankees file for the insights. So the Yankees file is very basic. So we have a basic uh, checkout SCM, Docker building, and uh, dagging it with our Artifactory. Then we uh, check that the DAG actually exists, so all the DAGs that we want. And we Docker login and Docker push the data to the Artifactory. And after that, it's done. This is all we needed to do to have a Zona Cube scanning or our scanning. It happens in the Automatic repair because of certain configurations. Uh, with the Nexus stuff, uh, we have done a bit more in depth analysis. So we have the Sonar Cube integrated here. So it informs it that, hey, use the Sonar demo ethical IO, uh, use the Cradle to command Sonar Cube. Uh, then we have, again, Docker building, Docker tagging, Docker pushing. But then we have the stage for push to Nexus, and it automatically pushes the, it to the Nexus. So Sonatype so Nexus and then scans these uh, images by Docker save and giving the Nexus policy evaluator the binary that we sent it to, and it then reports back through InfluxDB and so on. Uh, that's very shortly our pipeline. Uh, I can go more in depth if you have any questions about it uh, later on when I'm done but I see no questions, so no need probably. Uh, then uh, I go to the root demo uh, sonar, or well, let's make it running first. So, oh, no, it's not, please get out of my, okay. <clears throat> Zoom doesn't like me that much today. Okay, so let's put the Nexus IQ running uh, so it 
be a root demo, and in here the root demo build Nexus. So this, for example, uh, by the way, uh, the uh, Nexus IQ plugin in Jenkins also brings the data to Jenkins. So you see the uh, data in Jenkins. So you don't have to actually, if you don't want to integrate it or if you don't want to pay it, uh, you can bring it just as an informational text to Jenkins and so on. So not everybody needs the account for the Sonata, Sonata uh, if it's mostly about like just having the information. But when you want to see the report, you have to have the accounts to see it. Okay, <clears throat> so let's run this once. So let's tell it that, hey, start running it. And it's, a, okay, I put it running twice. But anyway, uh, it's now allocating an agent for it and starting to build an evaluation course. So while it's doing that, let's check a bit about the Sonar Cube, as said. So it's going to end up here in the Sonar Cube to this project and analyze this project. Uh, we're going to see one vulnerability. And in here, that's the vulnerability. But in here, there is also the activity. And we can see when the vulnerability was introduced and how long has it been in the production or in the tool. And when did we react to it? We can also see measurements of reliability, security, and visibility. So we can actually tell how, when did we get and what, and where do, should we focus on the cold. So once again, helps you understand what you're doing. Uh, I assume most of you have seen SonarCube at some point, so I'm not going to go in depth to that. But if you need any help, uh, I'm reachable via my uh, via Epicode, so info at Epicode and so on. Uh, it's in my slides at the end. So then, uh, after it goes through the root uh, SonarCube, it uh, deploys it to the uh, artifactor, which does automatically scan it with the JBrook. Let me check. I'm still logged in. Yes. And it will bring me the root demo latest uh, in this case. And we will have a new version here. And currently, we are in the version 150 in our demo. And we have the faster XML vulnerability everywhere because we downgraded it for getting these visibility reports. And this informs us that, hey, there is a vulnerability, and this is the references, what's the infected component, and which versions are infected. So we know, hey, let's put it over that. In our case, we are waiting for it never, uh, we're not going to put it because we want it to be a problem. You can also ignore and remove vulnerabilities if you think that they are not related to use. Uh, your use, and you can also scan for violations, assign custom issues, and custom licenses. So if you found out that there is a problem, you can also assign them here. And you can also export the data if you want it to go some other system where you would need it. Uh, then uh, you have the licenses. So uh, you have the different licenses discovered here. And you can see which license they are following and what would be the problem. So in GPL, for example, we get the link to the GPL uh, document and we know can, hey, GPL is actually in use for this space image and LBGL is in also lib and so on. So we can actually start discussing with our legal which license can be used. And we can also give the legal this bigger view of, hey, uh, we are using this much MIT, can you evaluate the MIT license now? And when something starts to grow, they can evaluate that and be like, hey, we should not use this. Uh, how can we not use it? And all of this is configurable by policies. So uh, <clears throat> my policies are configured to hell because I want everything to be prevented. But you can also configure them so that, hey, uh, please. Uh, generate woe wo for this and high for this and so on. I have prevented downloading uh, artifacts if the X-ray uh, doesn't, uh, if it finds these certain licenses. And we have also prevented building if it uh, finds these. So it automatically sends the build that, hey, you can't build because there is a problem here. 
Okay. Uh, that's your three X-ray. Uh, if you have any questions, please send them as I haven't gotten any questions yet. The, uh, yeah. Uh, so then to the next side queue, and hopefully our data will arrive soonish. And my browser didn't die. Let's see. Okay, now it works. So in Nexus IQ, we have a bit different UI. We have the dashboard reporting uh, and organizations and metrics. Uh, in Nexus, uh, things are thought of as organizations and under them applications. So we have an organization and I crew demo and under it certain applications. And then we have the organization sandbox demo. And we can filter out based on those. So example in our sandbox, we have nothing. But if we say would checkbox the root demo and apply, we would get the root demo application swoon abilities. And we can also remove all the checkboxes, and then we would get everything and all the violations for our, uh, management. Once again, we can uh, remove the problems. So if we don't want to see licenses because we don't care, uh, or if we want to see licenses, we can see those, or we can check security and get the security visibilities. Uh, it introduces the latest build report, and we can see what was built and how what happened and which violations were there in that report. Uh, we can reevaluate the report by asking it. We can generate a PDF report out of it, and we can see what which issues are affected. Uh, we also have a more detailed problem uh, description to our problems. So if we take the critical security issue and we see that it was introduced seven days ago. Uh, we can pick the, we can pick the security issue and show what's the issue there. So uh, for example, with the forbidden licenses, uh, it shows you when was the license and is there a big box, these red things show us if the policies uh, doesn't go through. And in this case, uh, it has always used an unrecommended license or forbidden license. And that way we can't go back or we can't go to newer and solve this problem. Uh, we find which license it's using. In our case, we have defined that Apache 2 has been forbidden. Uh, it shows the occurrence, where it found it, and what's the problem. It uh, finds similarities and policies. So in our case, policy forbid everything. And then I'm going to show you the vulnerability. So in this case, uh, we would go to the root demo once again and view report and get the policy types and security. Hey, there should be a security issue here. Well, I know at least here I have myself made a security issue here. So in here we have ESLint Utils 131, which has been found that there is a problem. And in this case, uh, we can see that, hey, it was introduced in 1. Uh, or 2000, so at the very beginning. And it was fixed on 1.41. So we should upgrade to 1.41 uh, or newer. And it shows that there is a lot of new versions. Uh, and it tells you automatically next version with no policy violation would be uh, 1.41. And it would show us what's going on there. Uh, we have the policy, once again, it, uh, it's a critical risk because of the CBS score. We have similar and occurrences, so it's found in two index JSs. Uh, we have vulnerabilities, and in here it tells us that hey, it's the CVE that it's part of. and description of it, uh, what's the CVE going on, and explanation, how did, was it detected, or how do you detect it, and what's the recommendation. So what does uh, get broken, what should you be avoiding, and how to avoid it. And the root cause of the problem being that there is the index AS in the ES uh, And the status is open. Then we had, uh, if I remember correctly, this one, 
yeah, in Sonatype's case, some of these have these Sonatype problem codes. Uh, this I haven't seen in JFrog or anybody else. Uh, so Sonatype has their own security team scanning GitHub and so on, and they do Sonatype data research as a source. So then they themselves find the issue, and it doesn't have a CVE yet, but it's uh, found by Sonatype to be a vulnerable part, and you should probably update it based on their own scoring. Uh, it can be good or it can be bad, uh, but it's a good thing to know that they have their uh, large security team working on this. Other thing is that we have more in the reporting side because uh, you can get the, as I said, you can see the view legacy report, for example, if you like a bit older reports. So this is the old report that was generated, uh, which was very easy to give to management. So the critical, sever, and moderate. And I'm coming to my end of my time. Uh, so back to my slides. So <clears throat> then, uh, how to get started. So I have collected here a quick list of how to get started. Uh, and it's basically without any DevOps here yet. So if you're doing this, just check box that, hey, you have done this. So uh, you are start by adding pull request for the team to review each other's code. Uh, you add automation to pull requests and get them their such things build status or comparable. So you now need a build status to show, hey, fail this build. Uh, you need something like uh, CI integrated there to get the build status there. Um, and then you can start getting DevSecOps there. So actual DevOps, but with security. So then my next thing would be usually to throw the static code analysis to your pipeline because it's two lines of code. It's, it doesn't take any time as long as you have the snark loop running. Um, then I would add the code vulnerability scan. Uh, well, yeah, it's the same thing. So the code, code vulnerability scanning is now running. Um, then I would add the automatic testing, for example, robot framework for the basic login at least. So let's check that the login works and that we don't, don't get the forbidden pages. <clears throat> Add some kind of uh, dependency slash packet checking to your system. It doesn't matter what, but just do something. And when you have done all of these things, you can think about adding some kind of GA proxy or comparable to your pipeline. And if you have all of these, then I would recommend hiring a professional security person to help you and think about what should you do to improve it. Okay. That's my thank you card. I'm two minutes early, uh, but uh, I, I would now, now like questions. Uh, yeah, if there are any questions. Okay, I guess I don't, is my slider working? I don't know. Check. Okay, I got a few questions here. Uh, yes, you can. Uh, so first I'm answering Costa's question. Can I scan artifacts from Artifactory with IQ server? Yes, you can. Uh, it has an automatic thing, uh, tool called Firewall, Firewall for JFrog uh, Artifactory if you want to prevent the things. Uh, if you want to just scan them, you can create an easy Jenkins job, for example, to show those uh, tools, uh, to show those builds easily. Um, then I have another one from Anonymous. Full CI CD flow uh, with all those tools results on spending lots of money. Are there any good free alternatives for JFrog, X-Ray, and other tools for small companies? Yes, there is. Um, well, they're not free, but they are for small companies. You can get away with something like Snook, uh, S N I Y K, <clears throat> and comparable tools. So there are. Uh, they have. Uh, what was it, 50 builds per uh, month limit. Let me try to Google it. So Snook.io, for example, has, um, you, they have a certain amount of anal analysis that you can do per month. So it doesn't cost anything to get started with it. Uh, but then when you use it actively, you have, uh, you have to get started with it. 
So you can do 200 tests for open source vulnerabilities to your private process. So that would mean that you can do, for example, one per week and you have you can get multitude projects there. Uh, there are other ones also, uh, but I would have to have a bit more Googling to tell you the names exactly because I don't remember them off the top of my head. Any more questions? These were really good questions, thank you. Okay, if no more questions, uh, I would like to thank everybody. And uh, hopefully everybody is having a good time, even though Corona is going on. And hopefully you can uh, focus on the nice talks.